Okay, th thank you very much, Professor uh, Friedman. And uh, it's been a pleasure to, to work with the uh, EU Center uh, for these years. And I'm very pleased to uh, help us uh, welcome uh, Professor Cox from University of Iowa. I was in Iowa giving a talk on this topic a few months ago, and we had a nice conversation afterwards. And he said there were a lot of parallels, what I was saying about Japan, to uh, his research on Europe, especially Northern Europe, in terms of the relation between the sacred and the secular. So it was a great opportunity to invite him uh, here and we could uh, speak uh, together on this issue. And our, our main point is, what is the relation in the modern high tech, I call it the high tech, so I'm, I'm talking from the Japan side especially, but I think it's true globally. What is the relation between the modern high tech world where words like atheism, secularism, um, of course communism in, in some parts of the world, and uh, I, the idea is, is isms growing uh, <clears throat> very much that aren't traditional religious. What is the relationship between that and the sacred? By sacred, I mean a general sense of religiosity or spirituality that is connected with traditional forms of religion and churches and temples and synagogues and mosques, but may take other kinds of uh, expressions in the modern world. And I guess our Conclusion, uh, to preview it, if, if Professor agrees to me, with me today, is that the uh, sacred hasn't disappeared, but it takes new forms. And so what we're going to try to do today is talk about some of those forms. And I recently published a book, Sacred High City, Sacred Low City, um, that's uh, on this topic. And as you can see from the book cover, the, there's a juxtaposition in downtown Tokyo between a Tori Gate, which is a Shinto shrine, and a modern high-rise building. And my question in Tokyo, where I've done research for many years, is why is it where there's so much modernization and secularization and high-tech, high-rise, uh, blue suit, uh, business salary man neighborhood, why does the sacred not go away. Um, the real estate in Tokyo is the most expensive in the world, and yet we find repeatedly that they make room for small and larger shrines and temples and other signs of the sacred. So uh, I have a, a lot to say, but I'm going to try to highlight a, a few key points in my time and then, and then hand it over to Jeffrey Cox. So uh, let me start by saying, and you have the handout in your uh, uh, hands, which uh, has some of the images I'll be talking about, um, that my research is mainly in the 13th century. And I always say that if Buddhism is right and we're going to be reborn, I'm going to be reborn in 13th century Japan. Uh, because uh, past, present, and future are an illusion. I can go backwards in time. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I was in Tokyo for uh, over 30 years doing research because I was uh, interested in studying archives about the 13th century. But when I was in Tokyo, I started to realize, hey, I should, I should look at what's happening today. Now, what is in Tokyo? Well, this is the university uh, where I've done a lot of research. And you can see uh, it's a concrete campus uh, with a high-rise uh, main building in the background. And um, this is another view of a neighborhood near the university in Tokyo. And there's not a speck of nature or the sacred uh, in any form uh, in that picture, it seems like. <clears throat> but this is another view of Tokyo, where uh, you see a large shrine with a lot of greenery and the high rises in the background. Uh, that's in a kind of a remote area in northeastern uh, Tokyo, but it's representative of images we find elsewhere. And uh, here are a couple of other examples where you find a Buddhist temple bell next to a high-rise building or a Shinto gate in uh, a main thoroughfare. And here's some other examples of what I call the sacred. Uh, the zigzag bridge is something you see in almost all Japanese gardens, uh, or also called the nine-turn bridge. It's very attractive, and the idea is that the demons can't turn corners. So you ward them off by having the, the zigzag effect. But the other philosophical view is that you can see reality from multiple perspectives. And I think that's one thing about the Asian worldview that we can bring to the table in terms of discussing this issue globally. Uh, this was, uh, other picture was just the garage in somebody's uh, home where they have Buddhas and flowers and little indicators of the sacred in just in a typical everyday home. And here's some other uh, examples of uh, the sacred being manifested in modern Tokyo. Um, here, here's one of my favorite uh, Happy Buddha statues with the magical shape-shifting fox in the background. 
at a, at a shop where people will buy these uh, statues and donate them to temples in Tokyo. Now, for those of you who know about Tokyo, and I'm showing a couple images here, Tokyo was built uh, originally around 1600 by the Shogun with the, what they call the high city and the low city. And to make a, a long story very short, the high city was the samurai area. That's the dark gray and the gray where the uh, Shogun favored the powerful warlords. He wanted to keep his enemies closer, so he, the more powerful you were, the closer you had to live to the uh, Shogun so he could keep an eye on you to ward off rebellions. And um, then um, the uh, low city, which was below the hills, especially in the northeast area of Tokyo, was where everything else was kept. So the merchants, because money was considered a uh, contaminating force back then, uh, the geishas, because uh, that was uh, risque uh, behavior, uh, the entertainment, the theater district, uh, and also temples because they catered to funerals and death, and that was considered to be uh, impure compared to the prosperity and the life force. As Tokyo developed, basically, they say, born Shinto, die Buddhist, and you find more Shinto shrines, which are symbols of prosperity and fertility in downtown. Tokyo, where the high-rise, high-tech business area, commercial area is located, and you'll find more temples in the low city area um, where there's cemeteries and, and, and funerals, which was considered to be impure in a sense, but um, the Buddhist funeral would purify the contaminating forces. And um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but these are iconic images of the contemporary train line that f still frames the high city versus the low city in modern Tokyo. Sometimes it's an oval, back here it was more of a rectangle. Um, and th these were the subways I used to take because uh, for a long time I lived in the low city area and I'd go to the university in the high city area. So on my way home uh, from doing a lot of research about the 13th century, I'd stop off at a different uh, neighborhood and, and view the temples and shrines there for over, over the course of many years. And um, to make two main points, and then I'm going to get to the point that's more comparative with uh, Professor Cox about what's happening in, in Tokyo, I use uh, two key terms here. One is I call impractical this worldly benefits. Now the point is, why do people do this in Japan? Why do the shrines and temples survive? Um, and the main theory out there is what's called practical benefits. Well, you want to pass your exam, you go to this kind of shrine. You want to uh, have good luck uh, when you open your business, you go to this temple. You want to go to um, a trip, well, you got to go to this shrine because they, uh, you pray for your travel safety. And there's a famous book called Practically Religious, which in English makes the point that the Japanese aren't really religious. They're doing something that's sort of like religion, but they really are superstitious. They don't want to say, you don't want to say that because it's politically incorrect, but the implication of most scholars in my field of Japanese religion is that the Japanese uh, pretend to be religious. They're not really. Uh, they're not really secular either because they can't get away from these superstitions. And if you go to Tokyo, you'll see that every day of the year there's a festival and there's some kind of uh, religious activity going on despite the fact that the, the scores are very low. If you say, are you religious to them? They say no, because they know they're not Christian and, and they, it's complicated. They have a hard time answering what, what they consider Western style questions. So I insert a negative here, impractically religious. In other words, people I think go for, uh, to attend the temples and shrines for other reasons, nostalgia, community, nature, getaway, sanctuary in the high-tech, hectic world. And I think um, people should not just look at religion as kind of an exchange. Oh, I'll, I'll make a prayer and I expect the deity to give me some benefit. I think actually there's a kind of sacred atmosphere going along. Now let me introduce a word from um, uh, that's often used in America. Civil religion, which refers to the idea that in America, where there's a separation of church and state, um, we still have sacred factors, civil religion, that kind of substitutes. We have the Washington Monument and Mount Rushmore and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and we have the holiday cycle of, um, of uh, uh, you know, let's say uh, Memorial Day, July 4th and Labor Day. We have the sacred food of the July 4th hot dog um, and you know if you landed from the moon would you know whether uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas 
was the, which one was the religious holiday. You might not be able to tell, right? Um, and I think that idea of civil religion uh, applies in the case of uh, Japan. But there's a difference. Japan doesn't necessarily have a separation of church and state, although it's complicated because post-war Japan borrowed a lot of uh, policies uh, that were American style. But the point in Japan is that I think there's no distinction between sacred and secular. People are not thinking that these are two worlds and you have one or the other. So it's not like they're substituting something for a missing sacred. They're manifesting the sacred in diverse ways. Okay, so um, here are some of the qualities I think that are evident in, in Japan. And um, nostalgia, uh, community, nature, sanctuary are key factors. Um, another key point I talk about is that one of the gods that's associated with the fox, Inari, plays a, such a key role across the board in both Shinto and Buddhist uh, shrines and temples. And I, I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but it's very fascinating to see that if there's one religion in Japan, it's not Buddhism or Shinto, it's a belief in the magical shape-shifting fox that can be a deceiver and a seductress and somebody, uh, a force that leads you astray, a kind of demonic force, but if that energy works on your behalf, it's a sign of auspicious good luck uh, and beneficial quality. And um, there are many, there are many um, uh, rituals on a daily and seasonal and annual and life cycle basis for uh, uh, this kind of uh, religious practice. But here's the key point I want to introduce that I think will touch base with uh, my colleague. Sac Sacro-secularisms. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful, but Professor Cox told me he liked that term, so I'm going to keep, keep with it, all right? Um, I had actually not used that in the book, but I had thought about that in giving some lectures. Sacro-secularisms. And the idea is that within the secular reality, the sacred enters into it one way or another. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see about the European case, but uh, an example of, um, of this in, uh, well, here, here's, a, here's an interesting example. After the great crisis of the Japanese earthquake uh, in 2011, the uh, Buddha statue that survived. Um, now, we see Madonnas that did that, you know, in Hurricane Sandy, I remember there was a famous case in Manhattan. Th that's kind of an example of what I mean by sacro, uh, sacro secularism. You see everything else around it is, is um, uh, uh, secular, but here is a manifestation of the sacred. Is, you know, I don't want to speculate whether this is some kind of miracle or not, but the point is that the symbol takes on a special role of importance. Um, and um, uh, here's, here's another example in Japan. The Butsudan is a Buddhist altar. When your ancestor dies, that's anybody in your family, even if they're younger than you, uh, you buy an altar to install into a room in the, in the home to celebrate and continue to worship and communicate with the deceased ancestor. One of the things is they found is that the old-fashioned kind, the dark wood kind, is uh, very expensive and kind of out of date. So they've made sleeker models. They made models that appear to appeal to people because they look like your television set or they fit into your uh, decor of your um, uh, living room. And uh, this, again, it shows that the uh, sacred maintains its force and continues. Um, okay, I'm skipping through here to, to find the... Uh, to find some of the images that I am looking for. Here, here are some examples of Inari, and um, look how many uh, foxes there are. Each one has a different look on its face. These are donated by people to the temple, again, when, uh, when an ancestor dies, and they want to make an offering. And they're designed in a way to kind of reflect their personal feeling with the deceased ancestor. And it's, it's uh, amazing how the, the crafter, craftsmen are able to um, build the personal features into each, uh, each and every appearance of the foxes. And here's some worshipers. Now here's a good example of sacro-secularisms. Um, the red and white banners <coughs> uh, are uh, offerings to uh, the fox god Inari. And you, those banners will talk about how much offering a person or a company is giving uh, to the temple and what, and what they're wishing for. 
Um, but here the, the theme of the red and white banner is used as an advertising for a film festival. And I know a couple of you in the audience uh, already know the next slide, but for those of you who don't, what about this? Not this one. Okay, uh, that's another example um, of it, but what about this one? <laughs> Where was this taken? For those of you who don't know. How about 107th Street? Right across the street from FIU. So when you go there, you realize you're worshiping Inari, the fox god. You just didn't know it, you know? Uh, they should import these into Office Depot. They'll probably stay in business longer. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip ahead also to, to some more examples. Uh, here's an example in downtown Tokyo, right in the heart of downtown Tokyo, next to the ministry buildings. A very intense, uh, you know, the capital area where you have the prime minister and the diet building and, and uh, ministry of education, all the ministry buildings. They keep this very intense forested area because this shrine is considered to protect the government. And uh, the priests from, um, from this shrine parade into the imperial palace once every other year. Um, but here again, we see how the uh, front gate is framed by the high rise uh, building, which gives it a different flavor. Um, here's, here's a shrine to one of the uh, generals who won the Russian war and the, uh, the war with Russia and China at the turn of the century. And uh, he's commemorated in a shrine, again with the red and white banners, because it's mainly used for uh, funerals. And next door you have the uh, uh, hotel, the wedding hotel, where the, where the um, uh, couple and, the, and, the, and their guests will stay. And here's a very interesting wedding procession I saw one day. Uh, when I was there, uh, very you know, very beautiful with the with the bride in the kimono. Um, okay, and here again in downtown Tokyo, you might not notice it unless you turn the right corner and uh, follow the pathway. But here's a very large cemetery right in the middle of downtown Tokyo. Why don't they just sell that real estate off and make a lot of money? Why do they keep that there? Are they afraid that the spirits of the ancestors will haunt them or? Do they have a sense of respect and nostalgia and community? That's, you know, I'm not saying I'm right and the other theory is wrong, but it's some combination. Okay, um, here's, here's uh, an interesting example I saw in, a, in some temples, and uh, I started to see it elsewhere also. It basically translates as something like everyone has their own life to live. And uh, you find this kind of spiritual statement being posted uh, near the temple grounds in various areas. Here's some fox masks. Okay, now to come to my uh, final points here. Um, and a couple of these images are on the uh, handout also, um, especially on the uh, flip side of the page. Um, okay, now here's a monk in, from modern China. Why am I putting this example in? Well, if you think of China up until uh, 25 years ago, you know, religion had pretty, pretty much been wiped out in modern communist China, and it would be dangerous to walk around in, in a monk's robes. Nobody, nobody would be doing that while Mao, Mao Zedong was still alive. But now it's become so commonplace, this guy can just sit at the train station and fall asleep while he's uh, uh, holding his rosary beads. Um, and, um, you know, a very interesting uh, intersection, I think, between sacred and secular. Now I go to another uh, cultural area. And uh, this is a hat stand in Jerusalem. Why in the world am I bringing up this example? Well, this is a bus stop when you take the bus to the Old City and go to worship at the Western Wall. It, whether you're Jewish or not, you need to cover your head. And if you get there, they have a little piece of paper they can give you, but you know, it's not very attractive and, or convenient. So a lot of people stop and get something more fashionable. Uh, is that sacred or secular when you're buying, uh, you know, exchanging money to buy uh, your nice looking uh, head, headgear? Uh, it's some combination or it's an example of sacro-secularism. And um, since I'm a Philadelphia Phillies fan, although they're going to be uh, in last place this year, I'm afraid I couldn't help buy, the, buy this one. Uh, but I take this picture <clears throat> and buy this for one of my sons. Um, and. Um, now we have the example, and uh, our Brazilian friend in the audience can't uh, say, and I get, just gave it away, but the upper uh, left-hand uh, Tory gate is in Japantown in Sao Paulo. And uh, where is the picture at the upper right taken from? Anybody guess? 
Pennsylvania? Close, because I'm from Pennsylvania, but this is actually New England. Uh, and how about on the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, back in Japan, you know, but they all kind of blur together at this point. And here's one, Kennedy, again, I know a couple of people have heard this before, but anybody, anybody new, guess where this one is from? What's that? It's from uh, Clearwater, Florida, where I went to see the Philly Spring Training game one time. It's just a Japanese restaurant, like the Samurai restaurant down on US-1. Okay, and uh, here's the real sacred space for me. Where did I take this picture? In Tokyo. Yeah, they, they have bagels now and, and Philly cheesesteaks. But, but if you're going to see a really Philly cheesesteak, the real sacred is this one right here with the cheese whiz and the hot peppers. So, okay. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it over to Professor Cox. It's a really good way to do research, you know, just wander around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, to, uh, you know, instead of sitting in dusty archives trying to stay awake and wondering when I can go get some coffee, you just wander around and you could, you could stop and have a drink whenever you want. You might even have something stronger than coffee because you don't need to be wide awake to walk around. And so maybe I'll try that. In fact, I sort of have tried that. Uh, my current uh, research is on well, it's, it's really on religious education in Germany and England, but I, I got interested in, in the whole issue of whether these countries can be called secular countries. I mean, it's one of the assumptions of the study of the modern world, and especially of modern Europe, that uh, uh, we live in a secular age. The age we live in now is secular. Now, when that age began, it really is it's kind of like a shape-shifting fox, you know. It, 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 uh, it shifts around and begins at different times. It, you, people used to, I could go into the history of this, but certainly recent history, well, a good friend of mine, Colin Brown, uh, just wrote a book called The Death of Christian Britain, and he, he dates the secular age from the 1960s. But at any rate, whenever it is, we're in it now, right? And it's, uh, the secular age is, is defined as an age, and you know, I'm concerned with ages because I'm a historian. We chop the past up into ages, and put names on them. And uh, yeah, that's what we do. And so uh, you know, when did the secular age begin? Well, the 1960s. So I thought, well, is the post-1960s Britain and other secular countries of Europe, especially Germany and Sweden, I spent some time in Sweden doing research on this too, are they in the recent history maybe the period of the European Union. Uh, is this a secular age or not? Now, one person who believes it is, is the Pope Emeritus, um, Benedict XVI, who once complained about proposals to bring Turkey into the European Union on the grounds that it would dilute the Christian character of the European, of Europe. <laughs> he actually said this. And, uh, but, you know, the, the Pope holds contradictory views because he also believes that the influence of Christianity has been on a steep downward slope since the Reformation uh, and, and leading to a secular age. And what he really wants to do is protect the um, kind of relics of Christianity. And that's one of the ways people understand religion. Uh, when they run into religion, they say, well, these are just kind of relics of the past that don't, mean, don't really mean anything now. It's like a kind of rusting automobile that still runs, but eventually it's going to stop, right? So you have uh, so the Pope, on the one hand, who, who once claimed that only seven percent of the people of Regensburg in Bavaria are Christian, uh, was still trying to protect the kind of relics of Christianity in a secular age. Well, when I, I started walking around in Germany, which is an interesting place to walk around, there are a lot of sites, religious sites, but they're churches. And it's well known that church attendance is very low in Germany. In fact, uh, very low. <laughs> but I go to church. It's one of my hobbies. Uh, and uh, often there are really very few people there, unlike American churches, which if you've been to any, are often quite full. And uh, not always. 
And uh, the uh, uh, but and so but the other thing I do when I walk around, instead of taking pictures of, uh, of Buddhist uh, shrines, is I talk to people about their religion. This is hugely embarrassing to my wife and children because I'm always chatting people up. You know, like bartenders in pubs, the person cleaning my room in the hotel, or uh, yesterday a clerk at Office Depot. Uh, and uh, but fact is, people don't seem to mind talking about religion. It's not like I'm asking them about sex or money or something. Uh, and one of the reasons is that they, you know, they haven't really thought about it. They don't really think it's very. And 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 if you start talking to people about religion, you'll find that people hold contradictory views. One that we live in a secular age when it's not important. But two. Yes, I follow these kinds of religious practices. I, 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 I follow them in my life. But they're not important. Now, one of the things I discovered when I was in Germany, a, a very secular country, according to the conventional wisdom, is that you pay with your income tax a church tax. And that, well, from the state where I was, in Baden-Württemberg, a big important state, I was in Stuttgart, 70% of the people pay their church tax. I thought, well, wait a minute. In a secular age, why are 70% of the people checking the box to pay their church tax? But the other thing I discovered, and perhaps this is even more important, is that 90% of parents choose for their children to have Christian religious training in the state schools. 90% in Baden-Württemberg. It's about 20% of the former East. It varies across. Well, I thought, this is really interesting. And so then I started talking to people. Did you have religious education at school? Oh, yes. Was it important? Oh, no. It meant nothing to me. Uh, and I said, well, wait a minute, I'm an educator. Surely classes mean something, right? Uh, but it's, it's very widely believed that this has no effect. And, and some of the teachers of religious education agree. They said this has no effect. What they mean is that their graduates don't go to church, which I think is not a very good way to measure the effect of it. So I started, I quit going to church and started going to school. And uh, I, I went, in fact, I ended up teaching as a substitute teacher last uh, late last spring, a class, a Catholic religious education class for 16-year-olds in the German city of Mainz. Uh, I was a, the substitute teacher. And this was the last day of class. And I've never seen a more bored-looking group. They were only there because they wanted to get credit for the class so they could go to college. The, the non-college track ones had long disappeared. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, I started asking them, well, does this class mean anything to you? Is it important? They all said, no, no, it's not important. And I said, well, really? Nothing at all? Because in Germany, with state funds, you, you learn religion, you, you have Christian teaching or a secular substitute every day. It's a regular topic, like math. They were very surprised when I told them that in American schools, there's no such thing. We don't teach uh, religion as an academic topic in schools, uh, in the state schools. Um, Catholic school student. And, uh, uh, and, and they, they were surprised by this. But then I started, you know, interrogating them and saying, well, is it, is it, does it really mean nothing? And some of them would say, oh, yes, it gave me an opportunity to think about suicide. One of them said it permanently turned me against the church forever because of the crimes of the church. I said, well, that's, that's an effect. Uh, another one said it gave me a certain respect for moral values that I would have otherwise learned. Uh, and... Uh, uh, which I think is probably the purpose of the course. That's why parents choose it, so their children can be trusted not to shoplift. <laughs> and uh, you know the. Uh, uh, but is this religious or is it secular? Well, you can you can look at it. You can say, well, this isn't really religious. It's really secular. But I've, I've started reading the textbooks that are used in these German schools. Here's one. Kirchen on sich und gemeinsam Gott suchen, the community seeking God. This is very heavy duty church history for 15 and 16 year olds. I mean, and they're tested on it. You know, it's, it's, it's actually quite an interesting text, insofar as I can make out the German. Uh, but it's got pictures. And uh, uh, so I, it seems to me that this is actually important and it's actually religious. Now, how you measure the importance of this, I haven't figured out. Because it's clear that, as the teacher told me, they're not going to go out and go to church. I asked them. I said, oh, no, probably not. It's like they hadn't even occurred to them. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can't measure across different countries levels of religiosity by church attendance. You have to look at other places. Uh, the German Christmas, I don't know if any of you have ever been in Germany. Christmas is a huge, huge deal in Germany. 
And people say, oh, it's just a civil religion. Well, wait a minute. It's all, people go to church on Christmas Eve. I heard a, a Roman Catholic bishop complaining about all the people who came to church on Christmas Eve. Vinox Ovid Christen, he said. And he complained because they were taking up the places in the pews for, that the uh, uh, church tax holders regarded as their own. And they were coming. I thought that if this were an American bishop, he would try to evangelize these people and sign them up. But in Germany, all, all the bishop was interested in is getting his church tax. And so, uh, and, and you know, there's a whole different uh, uh, function of this. Well, what about England? In England, they also have religious education in the schools. It's not every day. Uh, and I thought, until I started looking into it, that the religious education in English schools was like the religious education given to my daughter. Uh, she turns 30 next month. But 20 years ago, when she was 10, I was living in London and sent her to the state school down the road. And they had religious education, but she spent the whole semester studying ancient Egypt and the religion of Queen Nefertiti of Egypt. <laughs> and they would get on the subway and go down to the British Museum and look at the Egyptian antiquities and so forth. And I thought, well, that's it. There's no real Christian religious education. I think you could probably say that's not religion. But later, I turned out, when I started looking into it, that this was very exceptional. And in fact, in fact, the head teacher there uh, turns out to be a celebrity, but she got fired the year we were there for being too liberal in her views that in most schools in Britain, you have Christian or a sort of human rights substitute education in the schools taught by trained teachers. And further than that, in the 1944 Education Act, mandated that every school day begin with a Christian worship service. It's called what's called school assembly. And they had to sing hymns. And because it was the law, by the 1950s, people all over Britain were every school day, beginning the school day, singing Christian hymns and saying the prayers from the English Book of Common Prayer written in the 16th century. Because where do you get prayers if you need to publish a book of prayers for school children? You get them out of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. And it just hit me that in the 1950s, probably more people were saying aloud every day the prayers from the Church of England Book of Common Prayer than at any time in the entire history of Great Britain because of the law. Furthermore, the hymns became very popular. And the BBC TV picked up on this and promoted a Sunday evening hymn singing program called Songs of Praise, which turned out at one point, I believe in the late 60s, to be the most widely watched television show in the world in terms of viewership. It had 12 million viewers. Uh, it's now gone down. Uh, uh, and I thought, well, what kind of secular age is this? If everybody's sitting around singing Christian hymns, go to, you know. So, you know, the other issue is, you know, what about philanthropy? I mean, there's a, a very large investment in religious philanthropy by the state in, in uh, um, European countries. And furthermore, if you start looking at the philanthropies that appear to be secular, and I'll cite the, one of the most famous, Oxfam. I started doing research on Oxfam, and what did I discover? This was founded by liberal Christian activists who believed that the way to be a good Christian was to do secular, apparently secular work in the world, right? Uh, this is very clear from the records. At some point, the people in Oxfam became embarrassed by their religious associations because they thought they were unprofessional and they kind of purged this liberal Christian element from it. But it's a phenomenon that, that bears thinking about, and that is the invisibility of liberal Christianity. A lot of liberal Christians believe that the way to be a Christian is just to do good work in the world get involved in certain kinds of politics. And you wouldn't know that there were Christian motivations behind this unless you look for them unless you look for them. Sometimes you'll find them, sometimes you don't. Uh, so where does this all end up? Well, I really think we need to rethink, have I, am I done? I, uh, the, the, you know, as a historian, we look at processes of religious ch of, of, of change. And you know, we, we, we draw essentially timelines in the past and then we chop them up and we give them names. Uh, one of the problems with teaching Western Civ, which I teach, is when the Cold War ended, we entered a phase of history that doesn't have a name yet. And uh, everybody knew about the Cold War. But, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and so the, 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 the common historical uh, change that has to do with religion is the theory of secularization. 
here's a book cover that explains it. The Unintended Reformation. Here are the Protestant reformers who founded all the Protestant churches. On the bottom, at the top, a bunch of skyscrapers. This is a Catholic historian. He said it's all their fault. Uh, but they, uh, they ended up, we ended up with a secular age because of this process of historical change. And from a religious point of view, it looks like this. It's a downward slope until you reach the secular age. No, these things. They're only good for one thing. <laughs> secular age. My, my iPhone battery lasts longer than those. Yeah, these are, the, the, uh, but there's another way to look at, at religious change. There's, if you haven't read it, you should sit down and read Alexis de Tocqueville's great work called Democracy in America. Great work of social uh, theory uh, as well. Most Americans think it's a book about America, but it's really not. It's about democracy. It's about, it's about the relationship of, of religion and secularity, although he doesn't use those words. He uses the word, the, the spirit of liberty, the spirit of equality, and the spirit of free scientific inquiry. That's how he defines the secular. But in, in Tocqueville, in America, what you have is a sort of overlapping uh, spheres of the sacred, that is the religious and the secular. The American civil religion is in fact secular by most definitions. I think, uh, I don't think the word means anything. But there's also an overlap. And in history, these, these uh, circles shift and, and there are renegotiations going on depending on what phase of history we're in now. Uh, and, <coughs> and people who believe that we're in a secular age believe that this secular uh, part of it has shifted over to where there's just a tiny little uh, religious segment there. But I think that's a misrepresentation of the age we live in now. I think that, that there's all sorts of religion around in the secular age, if you're willing uh, to uh, look for it. And I could give uh, many more anecdotes about now, but maybe uh, I'll let you. Right? Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Have room for lots of interesting comparison and discussion, so I'll turn it over to you all. Questions? Thoughts? Secularism and religion? Yeah, please. Um, as someone who has family who's lived in Germany, I'm interested to see if, do you think that there will be a resurgence in religious beliefs, or if, if, or if you think the numbers will continue to, to decline as just society progresses because like as the young people are getting older like I noticed less and less and less of them have any belief whatsoever and they actually hold religion in scorn like they don't consider it to be anything you know worth saving so how do you think this will progress throughout I guess Germany in general and Europe as well? Yeah I, th I think that you know this is a, a new kind of religious settlement in which the, the sort of genuinely secular portion of it is, is larger now whether that will continue into the future people who believe in secularization would say yes because they believe there's a downward slope, right? Yeah. I don't know. But what I do know is, is that, that the presumption of the, the fact that you know, young people don't believe in religion anymore uh, uh, needs you to miss the fact that people who say, I hold the churches in scorn and I don't, believe, I don't believe in religion anymore, in fact, have religious practices and spiritual practices. That in fact, they're not as secular as you just said they were. And so what you have is not you have a downward slope of one kind of religion, but you also have an upward slope of a new, a new kind of religious formation in, in which you have to look at it and say, what's the relationship? How, how many people are, are really 100% secular? How many, and how many are in a sacro-secular, secular or sacro, what's the word? Sacro-secular. We, we invented a new word. Yeah. Uh, space it here. And, and you, you need to, to, to look at it and not just assume that you know What's, what's going to happen because you, you you know about the downward slope, and so I think you know I think what's opening up, you know one of the things people ask me is that if we don't have a downward slope, what's the alternative? And I there's a fountain out there that has all of these you know, water going over each other like this. I think there are multiple parabolas out there that that is some kind. You're on the downward slope of some kinds of religion, 
But there are upward slopes of other kinds too, and it may not just be the visible kinds, like American megachurches, which started growing unaccountably in 1972, starting a kind of parabola. They're now running out of steam. People are saying, oh, young, young evangelicals are abandoning their churches because they don't like homophobia or something. But what, 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 what you're getting is a, is, a, is, is a parabola here, and multiple parabolas. And so I think uh, the, the interesting question about the young people you referred to is what are their religious beliefs and practices? That's what I would ask. There may not be any, but it's worth looking. I have all kinds of questions. Can I do that, or well, is there anybody else for the moment? Well, let me, okay, let me, go ahead. Go ahead. You, oh, you were going to follow up? Yeah, I guess I was going to say, like, comparing to that as well, like, how you believe that the younger generations of Japanese people are continuing their own traditions. Because, like, clearly, like, from what I've seen and from what you said, that they continue on with, maybe not as religious, but they do continue their traditions through just a natural, you know, so it's a yearly tradition. <coughs> religious connotation. So do you think that the same thing, like do you think that they're going to continue it because it's tradition or? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, uh, let me come back to that one second. Let me make a comment because I, I recently had some travels in uh, Amsterdam and in northern Germany and, and Scandinavia. And uh, in Amsterdam I, I was telling Professor Cox, uh, I was interviewed by a Buddhist group and they said, well, Buddhism is the largest uh, growing religion in Amsterdam, and his comment was, well, if you start with like one person and it becomes three people, you know, so I, I don't know what percentage of Amsterdamites, but you know, I think one thing is, in the West, uh, Europe and, and, and America, there's a look for something exotic, and turning to the Orient, turning to Asia is something exotic and, and different from, from what they're used to. I also noticed in Germany, because of uh, Muslim immigration, you know, that was growing, because of uh, Russian Jewish uh, immigration to Germany. Uh, Judaism was coming back in, in some areas. Uh, whereas in, in Japan, um, because they've always had two or three traditions side by side and, and you know multiple deities and, and icons, I think it's a little bit easier maybe to hold on because it's not it's not like okay, can you do one thing or you do the other thing. Uh, and, and so you know I agree with you. I mean one, one thing that really struck me in looking at a festival in Japan uh, last summer or so, was the age groups. You know, you had the traditional people, the elderly people who were doing the tradition, but then you had younger people with, you know, Mohawk uh, orange uh, haircuts, and they were doing the tradition as well, and then you had the younger kids that weren't making any fashion statement one way or the other, and uh, they were still, you know, everybody really enjoyed it, and they were parading along, and you know, there's always a secular quality because there's a lot of shops selling nearby the festivals there. there there's a lot of drinking in public. Uh, you know, the sake is flowing and the, and the noodles are, are being cooked. So I think, it, it, you know, maybe it's a little easier to, to just keep it going in, in Japan because you're not forced to make, uh, make the choices. But, you know, coming back to America, people say, uh, what is the, you know, I always, um, you know, uh, point out to, to students, you know, what is the single activity that more people do than anything else in, in, the, uh, in the course of a year? And, you know, it just happened uh, two weeks ago, the Super Bowl, you know. Yeah. I mean, everybody's glued to the TV sets. They have the coin toss ceremony, you know. Joe Namath kind of blew it this time, right? <laughs> the color and everything. But, I mean, Usually you don't see the coin toss in a football game, you know? Um, but here that becomes, you know, a 15 minute ceremony that they make a big deal about. Everything gets magnified and it, be it takes on this religious aura. Uh, yes? Uh, you mentioned that in uh, Japan that they, they continue these uh, religious activities uh, sometimes in a secular way. I I'm curious which activities are continuing and are there any that are falling, that are falling by the wayside? For example, some of the some of the activities that they do, like uh, visiting uh, a temple at New Year's, is relatively cheap, whereas a funeral can be extremely expensive. And I'm wondering if the economics of the things that they're continuing, if they're continuing the cheap things, that are, are, are being affected by the things that are more expensive. Depends on which sake you're drinking, whether it's cheap or not. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you're right. I mean, the, you know, in a, in a larger version of this, I talk a lot about the funeral expenses and. Um, you know, it can cost uh, tens of thousands of dollars. All the all the different um, buying that Buddhist altar, um, buying the grave, uh, paying a donation to the temple priest, uh, all of it can cost 
uh, tens of thousands of dollars, and, and, and they're trying to kind of streamline it and economize. Uh, but you know, one of the interesting, interesting things there is it doesn't go away. People are still willing to make those payments. You know, one, one thing that struck me in hearing uh, Professor Cox's lecture was he's talked about two main factors, as I heard him, tax, the, you know, the church tax, and, and the bishops want to get the church tax, and education, where one way or another, uh, students get either a Protestant, Catholic, or kind of ethical, you know, uh, liberal education. And, you know, for me, the issue is the real estate, you know, which is a different, uh, kind of different point, and, and you're, you know, you're right, what, which things continue? Well, there, I, I think the funerals haven't gone out of business. The, the, the weddings are also very expensive. In the Japanese economic bubble, you'd have, a, uh, you know, a peach silk kimono for the bride, that could cost $25,000, and you're going to wear it the one time. And they went all out and had a Western-style wedding gown, which cost another ten or you know twenty thousand dollars, depending on how it was designed. And people went for all that. So now they, they you know they don't have both, or they have cheaper versions of both. But they're but they're still investing, and they're still doing it, and they're still enjoying it. Um, well, but you know, history is odd, though. You know, I think probably whether you're in Asian studies here or the, or the uh, EU students here. Uh, many of you still have probably heard, and they say that uh, in Japan the weddings are Shinto, the funerals are uh, are Buddhists. But uh, the the Shinto weddings are only about a hundred years old. That was kind of a modern invention um, in the in the era where they were building up to it, the emperor worship, and they were trying to get away from Buddhism uh, pre you know pre World War II. And it wasn't this age old tradition. There used to be Buddhist uh, uh, weddings, and there used to be Shinto. Um, uh, funerals, but because you know when things get locked in for you know uh, a couple of generations, we we tend to think it's always been there. So, uh, but but at the same time, I think to answer the question, uh, answer these questions, I think I, I am uh, taking a conservative view in the sense that I am defending the traditions, but I think they will continue. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Yeah. Like uh, in Japan, we have Danka. Yeah. That is very much like a church tax, in a way. Yeah, that's uh, true. Because yeah. uh, how many danka you have, and that certain temple will... The danka is kind of like parish. It, 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 uh, a, a danka is like a, par a member of a parish who, who donates or... Right, yeah. and for instance... Uh, for is that enforced? Uh, do they have to donate or do they... No, not donate, but for instance, a bone. Uh, yeah. So the priest will come. That one of the festivals, yeah. And like 10 minutes. Yeah. And you pay sometimes 20,000. 20,000 yen or dollars? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a couple Michigan zeros Maya, in different. Michigan Maya, okay. 200,000 yen. Okay. So it's about, a so about well, it's a couple hundred dollars, right? Yeah. yeah but, but it's still a lot for 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which I got to pay Yeah. I'm sorry, 2000 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Losing track of zero. And it's a lot of money, right? Yeah, but, that's a lot of money. Yes. Yeah, but my mother, she thinks it's obligated, it's a duty. Right. Because she's Danka. Yeah. And she thinks that support, you know, this certain temple. And, and the then, younger generation? What do you younger think? generation, yes, it's the same thing, like you said, 40, 49th day. Yeah. Or, you know, all those ritual days, yeah. we invite priests, mm -hmm. and each time we have to pay someone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a very ritual thing, and that's about him. Um, you spoke about how it's a tradition, but so the Zen, like Zen weddings are a very, I mean, sh sorry, Shinto weddings are a newer thing, but uh, I was thinking almost similar to uh, the Queen's Jubilee in England, how a lot of these traditions really weren't traditions, they were just very relatively modern. I was, my question is, how, how close is the government towards this? We just kind of addressed it just now. Uh, how, how close is the government in funding and supporting these, uh, not, not religious things, but cultural things in reality? Yeah. Um, yeah, it goes back and forth. And since the American occupation, they have adapted some of the American-style policies of separating church and state, so the government doesn't want to get uh, too involved, but you know the whole point of civil religion was to say uh, we can't endorse religion. But when a president gives a big speech, State of the Union or inauguration, uh, they somehow God is talked about a lot. If you add up the last eight presidents, you know they use God 20 times in those big public speeches. And, and I think it's a little bit similar 
in, in Japan, but they'll evoke more a question of nation, you know, and, and other kinds of indicators of something sacred that's not exactly God. Um, but I think the, um, uh, you know, one issue that came up with the, uh, the old town of Kyoto, the old capital city where there's, you know, wall wall temples. And how do those temples uh, survive? Well, tourism. But they don't charge a lot of money, unlike the, unlike the big rituals. But, you know, it's just a couple of dollars to, to get into the temple grounds. Uh, the question is, are you going to tax that or not? If you tax it, they have no profit. If you don't tax it, all of a sudden they have a lot of profit. Should, should they be untaxed? You know, I think uh, the may each new mayor of Kyoto has had a different view of that because they can fill the coffers. Um, Generally, they don't tax it. Generally, they, you know, they realize overall it's better. Is, is that an economic decision because more tourists will come there if it's cheaper to visit any particular temple? Or is that a sense of uh, loyalty to the, um, uh, you know, to the tradition? It's, it's, uh, it's always a little hard to say. There was another in the back. Yeah. No, I was going to ask you just spoke about how like, tourism, media, and technology plays a role in religion like, now. Like, how that has affected like the views on religion because it's like how you said it's just like you know obviously they don't tax like for these certain attractions because it's not like when you go there to do what you want to go but then it's just like you know you can basically go into like a temple or church or something for yeah. it can be so cheap and these people are here it's just like what is that kind of saying to the religion as a whole when you don't really have to pay that much to kind of go and see something that people there that if that's part of the religion they like find that so like oh, this is such a big part of me, but for you, you just want to see like the architecture and things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, uh, yeah, I'm interested to hear the, um, the Europe side, but on, on the Japan side, that's a very good point, you know, religious tourism. So why do people go to Tokyo these days? If you're going to take a vacation, you choose Tokyo. Uh, you're going to go to the electronics, right? You think you're going to get the most updated computer. I don't know if people still think that that is much because in the global technology, Maybe Japan isn't far ahead, but 20 years ago, you know, you get the best watch there, the best, the, the most updated uh, uh, video equipment there. Um, and, or, you know, you go down the street and you go to one of the big shrines and temples. That's, that's why people go. Um, I don't know about Europe if religious tourism, but that's an, an interesting category, I think, of the sacro-secularism. I, so, I think, you know, that, that raises a really interesting question because, you know, I, I, some things aren't, aren't religious. That is, you know, and, and yeah. going to see a cathedral because you're interested in the architecture, uh, you know, it, it may be, and you know, you might say that about his his archways in, in you know New England as well. Not really religious. It's it's a kind of religious form that's of interest to, interest to people. But at the same time, some people have religious motives for religious tourism. I mean, they they do. And, and there, you know, the, the people in, in England who are committed to the churches who are very demoralized all the time, but they're always looking for things to bottom out and turn up the other way. And there are two things lately that have bottomed out and turned the other way. One is Sunday church attendance. It bottomed out from, and why? West, West African immigration. You've got this flood of Nigerians and people from Ghana with church attendance. It's big time business uh, coming in. Now, half the church attenders in London on any given Sunday or black. And uh, so, so you have this, but the other thing that's turned around is Sunday services at the cathedrals. I mean, they're, they're actually growing very rapidly uh, in, in the cathedrals. And I think if somebody goes to a worship service there, I think you could say that's not religious tourism, although I suppose it might be. Uh, I had to stand in line to get into Coral Evensong at Westminster Abbey last summer. Not last summer. And, uh, and Coral Evensong is, is heavy duty religion. I mean, it, it's very beautiful, and you know, some people may be there for, uh, but but I think it's it's fair to call that religion. Uh, the other thing I would say in terms of religious practice, that's back to your question about young people in Germany, is is the confirmation of young girls, especially going to go away? Or they, I doubt it. I was just told by somebody that 80 percent of the young people in Norway have a religious confirmation service when they're 14. And why? Well, you get a lot of presents, you get a lot of money, you know. And so, you know, they're, they're, there's no such thing as pure religion. There's always, there's always sake and dress, wedding dresses and other, the other things involved in it. But I, I think, you know, you know, I think you're going to see, as you see the downward slope of some forms of religious practice, the persistence of others, you're probably going to see the growth of some others somewhere. And where that will be, I don't know. 
Um, do you don't think that uh, in the next 20 years in the United States, for example, that there will be enough of uh, a push and enough support from Americans to say, you know what, if preachers want to make comments about politics, that we should tax churches, or that uh, that that separation should no longer exist, or we should uh, reform that in some way. And, and I'm thinking about uh, all of these different concepts that are being uh, tossed around right now, and it's like, what what was the most important building in the world uh, when the the Kölner Dom, the the cathedral in uh, in Cologne, was built? It, it was that church. It was the idea of the church as well. But today, what's the most important building in the world? What's the what's the greatest structures that we have? I mean, they're capitalist structures to me. Well, if you, I, yeah, and you know, I always say like, if you land, if you were dropped down from the moon, uh, and you looked in my, uh, even in Miami, it's it's the domed uh, baseball stadium. Uh, <laughs> that's the biggest. You know, the sports... Which is ironic, and we despise it. Yeah, uh, right, right. Um, they overspend, but, you know, you go back to Rome, the Coliseum, you know, the, you know, the, the Mayans yeah. had their their, uh, their stadiums. Um, but that that's where we invest uh, the most money. My um, uh, Danish uh, friend uh, who was here recently said, uh, he doesn't know anything about baseball, but he said, he said, if it's a dome stadium and they cover it, how do you still hit it out of the park? <laughs> um, so I'm still pondering that issue, but... Yeah, you know, we, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's that's a, a kind of uh, side theme for all of this: the religion and sport, or the or the sport of the religious, the religiosity of sport becoming a kind of, you know, with the Super Bowl and sure. and the stadiums, you know, that's where people are investing time and money. If um, and, and so that becomes a kind of sacred. It's not religious, but. But I would say it's not necessarily just sports. I mean, mm -hmm. on the other hand, you do look at who are the highest paid public employees in the United States, and they're all either the coach of the basketball yeah. team or the coach of the football team. Yeah. And, and then... What right. You in the university, they say it's the president, it's the dean of the medical school, and the football coach. Right. But not necessarily in that order. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, what? why do those people get paid the most? Because they're the ones who bring in the most money, and I feel like capitalism, the money, is the new religion and that's slowly replacing people having their own uh, cultural dogmas or their own cultural uh, tendencies to, to stick to, whether it be in yeah. uh, Japan or, or in the United States or in Germany, what happened. Well, you know, people use this contrast between the cathedral and the skyscraper all the time to mm -hmm. show that the past was religious and the present. It's not religious, but you know if you, you, you need to look for religion in different places. We yeah. don't have a Cologne Cathedral. We have strip malls with Pentecostal house churches, in them, and we yeah. have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And you know, it, it is according to polls, more people in America in a year attend a religious service than attend personally attend all amateur and professional sports events put together. More, I, don't, I believe it. Yeah, you know. I, but what do Polish people have to say about anything? I'm kidding. No. <laughs> but, but let me say something else about Cologne in the 13th century. I mean, the richest people in Cologne and around Cologne in the 13th century were feudal landlords, not the church. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, the, 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 the wealthy elites aren't, aren't, you know, where you look for religion. You look at how they behave when you want to know how religion. Uh, you know, the Rockefellers poured huge amounts of money into... Uh, religious institutions, not cathedrals, including medical schools in China, and, and you know, uh, you know, all sorts of liberal Protestant philanthropies. The, the Rockefellers were Baptists, uh, and you know, Riverside Church. And so you have to you have to look in different places if, if you want to understand the relationship of the religion and the secular at different times in history. Now, the other point is resentment of preachers meddling in politics. This is a feature of of uh, young people, both among American evangelicals and European Roman Catholics. You're getting the same kind of reaction against the Catholicism of Pope Benedict to, uh, on, on uh, gay marriage, on homophobia, on abortion. Uh, you know, clerical celibacy is almost a moot issue now. And, and a lot of people are rushing down to, to resign their church membership precisely because of this resentment about meddling in politics. And I think the same thing is happening among young people who are actually inside the evangelical, the large evangelical churches in this country. I think they're really tired of the homophobia uh, and and the uh, hard line on abortion rights uh, uh, 
that that they're getting from their preachers, and I, I think that, that those churches are going to suffer considerably from that. I think you're going to see well, they are. We know in Germany because we can count the people who are the Catholics who are, are yeah, resigning sure. their church tax. It's not easy to, in, in Germany to resign your church membership, which is what you have to do. You don't just like in Finland. You could just click on the web. It's gone. You're, so no, longer, to you're no longer a Christian. Christian. <laughs> but but in Germany, you have to go down to the courthouse and renounce your baptism. You you have to, to say you know I know why that you know that's a that's a, a heavy thing to do and and people have been reluctant to do it. But but this and also the pedophile crisis in the Catholic Church. I mean this is just people running off to to resign their church membership. But, and but you have the leaders of the Catholic Church saying what pedophile crisis. Oh, no, 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 exactly. I mean, you, 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 you. And the football church, I used to teach at Penn State, you know, there's <laughs> that <football church. laughs> the same denial, you know, it's, it's phenomenal. But let me make a, this is a little bit of a subtle point, I think, but and I was in Germany recently, and, uh, you know, I saw in the 13th century, in this college town up in the north, and, you know, they, uh, somebody who didn't really, said they didn't really care about religion, but they were showing me around town, and they pointed out, okay, the, the, these were the big cathedrals, they were built in the, in the 13th century, and eventually they were taken over by the Protestant uh, church, you know, and they, they still called Saint something. They didn't take away the original Catholic name. I was a little surprised to see that. And then they said, and this was somebody who didn't care about religion, they said something like, this particular cathedral was known as the first one to have a sermon um, by a Protestant preacher after uh, the start of the Reformation by Luther. And I said, uh, and, and then they went like, you know, and that was in the 20s. Now, here's my point. When somebody says that was in the 20s, we think of the 1920s. And I'm going like, what? That was the first? And I realized he meant the 1520s. You know, but uh, he didn't care about religion, but yet I think he was kind of living with this personal sense of history, maybe. It was ingrained by the education. Exactly. Right. I just wondered if you know, pilgrimage. Yeah. 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 Uh, in Japan, like a Shikoku, 88 yeah. places, yeah. Uh, many young people started to, you know, visit. Those well, that's temples. true. Yes. And uh, you send me the website. Yeah. You know, for the young people. Yeah. And that's amazing. Yeah. 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 That's where you see a revival. Shikoku yeah. is the uh, is a, is the island uh, near central Japan. That, that has a deep religious history, and there's 88 temples around uh, around the island, and uh, and people will go there. It takes about two, what two two months or three months yeah, to yeah. you know to, if, if, you, if you walk. It's a little bit like yeah. that one in northern northwest yeah, like Santiago, right, right. A little bit like that, mm -hmm. and and it's been it's been more and more popular. Of course, Mount Fuji, you know, uh, there's clubs and associations, and people of all ages do that. Is it just mountain climbing, or is it uh, do they believe in Fuji? Is it, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say, um, but the, uh, uh, you know, th this phenomenon goes back in, in Japan when the Shogun, Shogun life back in the 1670s was very, very strict, but they'd say every 50 or so years, people would just say, screw you, Shogun, we're just going to uh, go off to one of these shrines, uh, we're going to go to the hot springs, we're going to, you know, party, uh, because, uh, uh, get away from the Shogun's uh, iron hand in Tokyo. And uh, you know the impulse to travel, and 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 that's part of what uh, the shrines in nature mean. And I think the, the probably the cathedrals, even if they're in the center of the city, it's it's a getaway from the mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, first it started practical. Yeah. You know, so first it started then say mm -hmm. but by the end it began then say yeki Right. In Japanese, I add that he meaning a negative, impractical. But we wanted Professor Freeman's questions. You said uh, yes. Um, well, we're out of time, but I'm going to okay. ask a provocative question, and we could just let it hang there if we need to. Okay. But listening to the two of you, it strikes me that rather than looking for where religion still exists, is we should be asking ourselves why we think it, we live in a secular world. So is the kind of commitment to secularity um, tied up in our notion of being modern or postmodern? What about that? And and you know, I, I would have thought so anyway, but hearing the two of you, it even strikes me more that of course we live in a society that is so inundated with religiosity in so many ways. And if we kind of stretch religion so far as to include like the post-war 
global commitment and, uh, to consumer society. Like, is that a religion? One of you, I think, suggested it could somehow post-war consumption itself is a kind of new religion or a religion that very often has or a practice that very often has religious symbolism mm -hmm. contained within, then these concepts become so kind of amorphous that yeah. in a way it's hard to even pull them yes. apart and say, oh, we're less religious, right. we're more religious, right. we're more right. secular, right. we're modern, we're not. So why the commitment to being secular? Well, yeah, it's true. I, I object to, to other people. So I appreciate your comment. When you stretch the definition of something, so it's so broad that it takes in, it's, you know, it encompasses the opposite of what it is. It's, right. You know, um, <laughs> So that you know, that's a kind of logical fallacy. But uh, my take on this would be to say that, um, that, that uh, you know, this is helping to clarify my thinking. You know, to me, the sacred is what you value over and above the humdrum every day. And it might be found in the humdrum every day, but it's it's a matter of value. So the almighty dollar, if you value that, oh, okay. you, you see that that that's what I'm I'm using. So not religious, but sacred. It strikes me so that's why I'm using sacred. Different. Right. I remember a friend of mine, you know, was going to write a blurb for the book, and he used the word um, spirituality. I said, no, I'm not really talking about spirituality. I'm talking about something else here, sacred. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, maybe, you know, that's really a, a difficult question to answer. And, 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 you know, I think the word secular is, is the opposite of religious. And, you know, that, and, and I, I've never accepted the notion that you know, Paul Tillich always used to say that everyone is religious because there's no such thing as an atheist because everyone has a ground of all being, you know, and it could be. But to me, the notion of religion only makes sense if it's something that transcends uh, the, the, the rational material world. Mm -hmm. It only makes sense in that sense. Okay. And, and in that way, Inari is, I think, does that. Even yes. though there's no God here, because this is a, a, a I mean, supernatural may not be quite the right word. And, 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 and you know, the sacred can be attached to things that aren't religious, I think. Okay. I think you yes. could say, and simply identifying everything, it's one thing I noticed that I really maybe differ with, with Professor Hein here, is, is that, you know, for secular to mean something, it means not religious. And in, in particular cases where these things overlap, it's very difficult uh, to, to sort these things out. And it is very offensive to try to tell somebody who believes they're secular that you're not really secular. I mean, you know, <laughs> people, people have a right to be atheist and they have a right to be secular. I know there are people like that because I'm married to one. Every once in a while I go to my mom. She doesn't have a religious bone in her body. And, and, and so, uh, but, but you know, my, my real point is that you need to look at when, you know, People, when people contradict themselves and say, I'm secular, but engage in religious practices, you need to analyze that and say, well, what's going on here? Yeah. What's happening? Why are, is this kind of cognitive dissonance? Or is it, is it just the kind of contradictions that we all have in everyday life? Mm -hmm. And as a historian, as a scholar, I like to try to measure these things. Yeah. And, and uh, so that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing by counting the church tax. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I think we're out of time. Thank you all very much. Yeah, somebody. Oh, okay. You might have inherited it.